The fighting is intensifying and in many places the Afghan government's enemy is at the gates. And with them comes the promise of retribution and murder of those who worked with the West. There's a certain grim inevitability about what's happening at the moment. Um, I think we could have predicted, but as the US and NATO lifted off this summer, that the Taliban would seek a symbolic victory of trying to capture a, a provincial capital. Uh, and that's exactly what we're seeing right now with Lashkar and Kandahar and Herat. Um, you know, and, and they're going to focus their attention on that. And that's, uh, that's very difficult for us to sit and watch. And of course, it, it, it poses considerable risks to the groups which we're trying to support. In recent months, the insurgents have taken over large amounts of the Afghan countryside. Today's clashes on the outskirts of Kabul follow recent Taliban attempts to infiltrate the country's other main cities, Kandahar in the south and Herat in the west. In both places, there's been violence in the suburbs, but government forces are holding. However, in Lashkar Gah, the capital of Helmand province and centre of Britain's campaign in Afghanistan, the situation has become critical. Right now, as we speak, I mean, the, the, the battle is going on for Lashkar as we speak. Um, so every half an hour, uh, you speak to someone and you get a slightly different picture. Um, the government position is, is perilous. Um, they've lost control of the, both the airheads, so they can't get reinforcements in easily. Um, they still hold the police headquarters and the governor's head count, uh, compound, but really they're looking at maybe one square kilometre in the centre of the city. The rest of the city is held by um, Taliban. During its operations, the British Army was critically dependent on interpreters, and indeed we saw that when we covered the fighting there. Many have already been resettled, but hundreds, including a man we've spoken to and will call Ali, have not, despite six years working for the British Army. You know, sir, everybody uh, is, uh, is aware, so the interpreters are in a danger because we work for uh, British forces. And many of my uh, colleagues, uh, they are also in a danger, uh, especially the Senate interpreter, because we were the people we worked honestly, bravely with British forces in a hot condition in Helmand province in 2009, 2008, 2011, 2012, 2013. We were the people actually, we were, uh, we stood uh, bravely, honestly with British forces out on the ground in the front line against Taliban. But the Taliban are waiting uh, uh, for their revenge. For him and hundreds of others, the UK says they're not eligible for resettlement because of the way they left its employment or worked for contractors. Now, surely some were guilty of crimes or misdemeanors, but in many cases it just comes down to personality clashes that cause them to leave, or as Ali puts it, a clash of cultures. What's happening now, though, is that a group of senior officers are pressing the UK government to let these Afghans in as a matter of urgency. It's a relatively generous policy, but, but, but we'd like to see those dismissed. We'd like to see that addressed. We'd like to see those who are employed on third party contracts. We'd like to see that addressed. I mean, it's insane that, that they, are, they are not eligible because they were on a third party contract. I mean, I mean that's, that's an absolution of responsibility, abrogation of responsibility by the Ministry of Defence. Unable to travel to the UK, many who work for NATO, like Ali, have nowhere else to go. Uh, I don't have an alternative. What to do? If I travel to Pakistan or other countries, uh, there is also no safe place for me because uh, there are the uh, hotbed of the insurgents or, or the Taliban. So they will find me and they will kill me. You know, actually, uh, sir, I cannot go to my own province because uh, my village and my district is all controlled, under control of Taliban. Actually, sir, uh, I have lost my way. What to do? I, have, I don't have a plan. The only plan I have is I'm yelling uh, for help from the British government, from the British forces to help me, to support me, to take me back to the UK as my other colleagues who were eligible. Tonight, the Defence Secretary tweeted that Afghans working for contractors or dismissed for minor offences will be eligible for resettlement. But with the issue under discussion for the past eight years, they'd better be quick about it. 
Mark Irwin joining me now is Afghanistan veteran and Labour M Mayor of South Yorkshire, Dan Jarvis MP, Kai Edi, the former UN Special Representative of Afghanistan, and Faria Saidi, the director and presenter at Zan TV, the first TV channel for and by Afghan women. Good evening to you all. Dan Jarvis, if I can just pick up on that Ben Wallace uh, announcement tonight about interpreters. Pledges that civilians working directly or indirectly for the UK government will be brought to the UK to keep them safe. Does that reassure you? A little. They need to move at pace. As Mark Urban has just said, we've been fighting this particular fight for more than eight years. There is no doubt that Ali and hundreds of others like him, who we served alongside, are in mortal danger tonight. And I think, if not a legal responsibility, we certainly have a moral responsibility to support those people, given the service they offered to us while we were in Afghanistan. And are we talking about hours and days rather than weeks? It feels that way. The situation is undoubtedly very grim tonight. Huge pressure on the provincial capitals in Lashkar Gah, Kandahar and Herat. It's heartbreaking to see it. For all of those of us who spent so much time there, it's terrible to see the situation that Afghanistan finds itself so in. No stable government, no peace uh, settlement uh, likely anytime soon, so and the Taliban in ascendancy. This is precisely so what we didn't want to see, and it is devastating to see it play out in the way that it is. And if we're going to look at where uh, the problem lies here over the last 20 years in terms of the British response, in that 20 years there's been a Labour government, there's been a coalition government, there's been a Conservative government, and each failed in the basic mission, which was to build a government that had legitimacy, competence and the means to survive without us. Each government failed. Absolutely. It's strategic failure. There is no doubt about that. I remember on so many occasions, very senior people in the UK government saying this would be the year that the tide would turn in Afghanistan, but it never has. There are many reasons why we found ourselves at this point, but we have to accept that the conduct of the campaign didn't lend itself towards success and we've walked away from Afghanistan at this critical moment and I am deeply fearful for the future of the country and the impact that, that will have on, on members of Afghanistan population but of course in particular for women and girls we know what the Taliban's record is and we've got to do even at this late hour everything that we possibly can to work with regional partners to coordinate activity with international allies, to pull every single lever that we have left. Well, let me just put talk to, to, let's yeah. talk to an Afghan right now, Faria Saidi. Um, you're in Canada now. You have relatives in Afghanistan. What is the mood just now? What are you hearing tonight? Yes, um, I live in Canada. I do have friends and colleagues that I work with um, that are living in Afghanistan right now. Um, unfortunately, as everybody knows, the situation is really bad, the security situation in Afghanistan. Um, I was actually just speaking with a few people in Herat. Um, as you know, there's a fight going on in Herat right now. And people are on the streets, on their rooftops, showing their support to national forces and um, encouraging them to fight against the Taliban. Um, it's disheartening for us uh, to see the situation getting worse and worse every day. Um, I do speak with my colleagues and my families in there, and then their lives are at risk. Um, they're concerned about their lives, and they want an end to a war that's been going on for years. So you uh, helped to run a, a woman's television station in Afghanistan, obviously you're in Canada just now. Do you think that station is going to be able to continue with safety for much longer? No, unfortunately not. Um, we already have women that have faced, um, they've received threats from the Taliban, they've received, um, you know, telling them to not show on their faces on the screen. They aren't able to show their faces on the screen. I was speaking with someone, of, um, a colleague, um, and I was like, you know, you guys should do more reports and stuff from Afghanistan. And then her response was, we're not able to do that because we see how they treat people that work in the media. They, we see how Taliban treat people who work in the government, what injures. We saw a recent example in Kandahar when a comedian and the name of Pasha was murdered by the Taliban on a day like videos with all social media. So people fear and they're not able to do it. And no, uh, not Zan TV or any other media stations will be able to function if the situation gets worse. Um, Kai Edi, you were the UN representative of Afghanistan. The UN failed, the Western coalition failed. Do you think there's anyone who can actually deliver peace in Afghanistan now? Well, there's there's a little bit of hope, I think, in 
in, in all the drama, because I think all the countries, as main stakeholders involved, face a situation also that's different from what it was only two, three months ago. It's turned dramatic in such a, such a, uh, over such a, a few weeks. I think the Chinese, the Russians, the Central Asians, of course, are afraid of spreading of extremism on their territory, and rightly so. I think the Europeans should fear a new wave of refugees to Europe. Uh, that is certainly not anything that they would uh, like to see. Uh, and the US, of course, uh, cannot uh, be seen as standing by when you see this drama unfolding. So I think there is today a possibility, simply through the fact that it's becoming so dramatic, and all the main countries that I mentioned have a stake in this uh, for their own personal security's interest. So that gives me certain hope for the international community to come together, finally, I must say, after a long hesitation and lots of fragmented uh, efforts. So that's why I proposed, together with my Japanese uh, colleague uh, Yamamoto, who served after me, uh, that the Security Council and the UN Secretary General now should really um, play a much more determined role than they but, have done. Uh, well, I was just going to say, I was going to ask you about that. Do you think the UN has played a sufficient role in the last 20 years, frankly? I think the US uh, did not... Uh, UN. The UN, no. Uh, you see, when no. I was there as a special representative, I had uh, contacts with the Taliban. I also said, I think that I was the first one, who so said in the Security Council that the military solution is not going to work. We have to find a political way out of this. It was ignored at that time at the highest level, also at the UN. And it's continued more or less like this, I think. And the UN, I think now, if they can manage to bring all these main stakeholders in the Security Council together in a determined way, that's the only thing that can make the Taliban respond and also the government, because the government is not completely without blame here. It's yeah. been dragging its feet, not be able to come up with a unified position, etc. Um, but I see that as being the only way well, out now. Well, I want to put that to Faria. Do you agree with that? Do you agree with that? Tell me, what do you think is the best way to secure peace? So, um, I know this um, conversation has been going on for a very long time, peace in Afghanistan for years, but um, what happened now is that the peace process that was placed in, 20, in uh, 2020 for Afghanistan, unfortunately, it was not for the benefit of Afghanistan, but it was for the benefit of the United States. And the contract signed between the Taliban and the United States, it was nowhere stated that the Taliban would not kill, kill civilians, but rather it was like to not mm -hmm. kill um, U.S. soldiers. So, and they stay, uh, the Taliban focused on that and stayed on the, their agreement, but they killed the Afghans and they killed civilians. I want to focus on one point here that what can happen now, what can we do now? What I can say, yes, sure, everybody left Afghanistan alone at this point, but what we can do is that call out on the, ter uh, on the terrorists or um, ta Taliban that are killing Afghans and killing Afghan civilians. That's something that the international community can do to call out them, don't provide them with platforms to sell their propaganda. Every single day there are people dying in Afghanistan. And that is something that needs to be covered in the West, that needs to be covered in the media, and needs to be covered by everyone that are concerned about Afghanistan. That's something that we can do. And then Afghanistan knows its enemy. They know that the Pakistan are a big supporter of the Taliban. But unfortunately, that but, is something yeah, that we don't hear. That they, is something they briefly, nobody calls so just very briefly, Faria, very briefly, Faria, just picking up on that previous point, the Afghan government is not blameless, is it? So I don't know the point uh, of discussing this, whether the Afghan government is blameless or not, but right now the Afghan government is fighting against Taliban, fighting yeah. against an organization that is that has all the support. You know, just before this uh, meeting right now, I was speaking with someone in Herat, and then he, I asked him, how are you, how is your family, and what's happening, and then he, he said, uh, no, we don't know how we are. We don't know how we feel. All we see is that the Taliban killing uh, the national forces. We see Taliban yeah. killing people. They have all the yeah. equipment. And I even asked them, like, who is supporting them if they have all the equipment? The latest weapons are with the but Taliban right now fighting against the national forces. Let me just very bri briefly bring in Dan Jarvis then. I mean, there's no question, presumably, of any British forces going back. We, you know, we lost uh, almost 400 troops, thousands more injured. What is the best thing that the, the UK can do to be a player in this end game, if it is indeed an end game? 
we need to remain engaged. At the moment, it does appear that the strategy is to hope that nobody notices that the country is descending into chaos. It's quarter to midnight for Afghanistan. We still retain some influence. We still have the ability to leverage influence with our allies internationally and with partners in the region. And we cannot walk away and abandon the country, given everything that we've committed to it over the previous 20 years. And I very much hope that the British government will step up and show the leadership that has not been shown in recent years. Thank you all very much indeed for joining us.